I'm John Biaggi. I'm the director of the Human Rights Watch International Film Festival. And the festival, where it came from, where it started, it was started here in New York in 1988 by Human Rights Watch. It was on the 40th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights. And there was a feeling then that they needed to do something more to let a broader audience know about human rights because back then in 1988, as you might imagine, human rights was not exactly on the tip of everybody's tongues. And so Human Rights Watch wanted to reach a broader audience outside of just their reports, which was a very targeted audience and get the message and the meaning of human rights out to the wider world. And so they created the film festival. It has been in New York since, and it has expanded. It expanded to London in 1996 and uh, was very successful there from the start. In fact, the Europeans have been a little bit kinder to the festival as far as press goes in particular. They're very interested in the festival in Europe. We have great press and we've We've basically kept the same format for the most part, which is around 25 or 30 films per festival. Um, in New York, it's a two-week span at the Walter Reed. In London, we've done a number of picture house cinemas, which has been very nice. And uh, we generally haven't expanded it beyond that because, not only because of the staff considerations, but also because there's a feeling that it's better to have a very strong tight program of films than to have 80 or 90 human rights films where a number of them are what I would say as compromised films then they're kind of on the weaker end. Better to just bring a very strong crop every year and show the people that because then you get your message across much stronger. And what is that message? The message, the message of the festival is there's a lot of messages, but I think one of the big things is we have tried over the years to dovetail more and more with the work of Human Rights Watch and to basically support some of our work, especially reports that are new or coming on the horizon on particular topics, where we can. I mean, it always depends on what films are out there. That's always the Achilles heel of a film festival is, is there a film on something that you are just dying to have a, a film on for this year, or is it just not to be? I mean, for instance, Iraq's a good, a good example. When the Iraq war began, we would have loved to have shown a great film on Iraq the first year after the war was commenced, but there was nothing out there. Because with a lot of these subjects, it takes time for the really good films, just like a wine, to come out. And it, it's, it took about three years before we saw some really strong films on Iraq. So we, we do, we're trying to support the organization and its message, its many messages on various human rights topics. And I think the festivals also has the job of pushing the organization a little bit uh, towards things that it should maybe be working on but hasn't gotten to yet, an example of which would be environmental human rights, where the festival's out front. We've shown a number of environmental films over the years and it's sort of our way of saying to Human Rights Watch, you know, this is really something that should be part of the agenda or a bigger part of the agenda here. Are there other examples of that sort of thing over time that, have, that the festival has sort of pushed and have become part of the programming of the organization? Well, the, there's other things the festival has pushed. I don't know if they've become completely part of the, of the organization's program. I mean, for instance, we have... A youth program, Youth Producing Change. This is the second year of that program. And uh, it has been very successful. Actually, this year it just sold out before it started, which is really quite remarkable for a youth program. <laughs> the, the opening night youth screening has sold out. But um, this is, you know, youth and their concerns and how they view human rights is, a, is quite a fascinating topic. And I think that it's something that that the festival is very proud to present, but also it's important for us to show because the opinions of youth is so important to, to the way the world is going to move in the future. And so I, I, I feel it's very important for us to show it. Human Rights Watch does a lot of work on youth, youth incarceration in the U.S. in particular. We've done a lot of work on prisons and also on LGBT issues with youth in schools who are, weren't being treated well 
and then of course child soldiers and other issues of, of younger children. But um, we're sort of still at the vanguard of showing you know, films about youth and taking their human rights opinions into very strong consideration, something that I don't think the organization has quite gotten a handle on yet. Over at Witness, we've been working for the last couple of years on a project called The Hub, which is what this video is appearing on. And it's, it was really an attempt to look at the kinds of content that was sort of bubbling up that people are making on their own, uh, exchanging on their own. Looking forward, is that something that you see sort of percolating into the festival more and more? You know, individual produced media, right. more gr sort of grassrootsy, even citizen produced media? That's a good question, whether that, that is the case. I mean, I think that eventually you will see that it, because it'll percolate up into the way films are made, documentary films in particular. Uh, I mean, if you look at a film that we showed in London but didn't show here because they had a theatrical at Film Forum, which is great for them, uh, Burma VJ is a good example of a film that's use, using other media, particularly reporters, small format camera media in Burma of the abuses of the police and the crackdowns, and fashioning a very, I would say, a very slick, in the best terms, film out of that with some very tastefully done recreation where the main character is its sort of recreated scenes of him on the phone talking to his reporters, finding out what's up. He's in exile outside of Burma because of his safety, and he's calling back in to, to, to organize and to keep them motivated and to keep them going. That's how the film is structured, and it's a very interesting construct, and it works very well in that film in particular. So I see a lot of that sort of hybrid use of media where you're using footage that might be very rough or very immediate, you could say, and then fashioning it and crafting it in different ways and creating a film around it. I mean, that's the main thing that I see coming out of that. Another sort of trend that I see coming in the future is exemplified in a film called Back Home Tomorrow that we are showing in the festival. It's by a very gifted filmmaker, Fabrizio Lazzaretti and uh, pa Paolo Santolini. But Fabrizio is the cameraman, and he, we showed his film Jung in the land of the Mujahideen years ago. And the thing about Back Home Tomorrow that's so interesting to us is that it's a documentary, but if you watch it, it, it reads like a drama. If you didn't know, and if you just came into the theater cold, you would be wondering if you were watching a drama for the first, I don't know how many minutes, but it could be 20 minutes, because... He's crafted it, he shot it so beautifully, and the editing is very dramatic. And, but, it, but it is completely a documentary. But it does bring up this whole question of reality and how reality is constructed and how different people look at reality very differently and use it in ways that's sort of novel. I, I think you might see more of that kind of documentaries in the future as well. Um, the venue of a film festival, the format of a film festival, is something that allows you to present multiple perspectives, multiple approaches. You know, to curate a festival is a sort of major job and a major work of sense making. What do you think that role does for human rights in a way? What's the role of a festival, particularly a film festival? which is you know, projecting images to closed audiences of people. What does that offer for us working, you know, for me particularly, um, working primarily in an online sort of space where there's a sort of supposedly infinite and consistently exponentially growing audience for curation? What's the difference and what's the sort of role of curating for a physical audience in a sort of time-bound festival format? That's a very good question. Not something I get asked very often. I think the the format of a of a film festival with a real audience in theaters is is there's a few layers. I think you when you bring a group of films together, they talk to each other in some ways. And even in in this program this year, you look at some of the films and you start putting together different stories that may be from different countries, but there's a common theme or there's a feeling of where the world is heading on some 
on, in some sense, when you curate, say, 32 films like we have in New York on different human rights themes, the ones that have bubbled to the surface this year and then collecting them together, it does create a sort of a, a vision of one possible future of what the major problems in human rights will be coming up on the horizon. At the same time, in a physical space, you get the filmmakers there. And that is a, is a very interesting dynamic. We, at the festival, one of the main things we do is we try to bring almost all the filmmakers in for all our festivals because we feel that it's the dynamic between the audience and the filmmaker that creates different possibilities that you couldn't get without the physical presence of the two entities, the filmmaker and the audience. If they were, I mean, excuse me for saying, but if it was online, it's not quite the same feeling. You don't get that feeling in the room where people are animated there and they're energized to do something and they actually have in front of them the person who can tell them what they can do to help this human rights situation. And that is a very unique experience that I think the film festival provides for the audience and it's very important for human rights. And I don't think you get that in any other setting at this point. I mean, eventually you'll get you know, virtual holographic people coming to the theater, the filmmakers here holographically, but still there's, there's something about someone being there and being able to talk to them and afterwards to talk to them more. There's a lot of connections that are made at the festival and those kinds of connections are, are very strong often and I think they create things and they create movement on some of these human rights issues that you simply wouldn't get any other way. Can you give me concrete examples? Well, let's see. Yes, I mean, last year we had um, a beautiful film on um, rape in the Congo. It was called The Greatest Silence by Lisa Jackson. And Lisa is the consummate filmmaker and um, advocate. And she talked to people after the screenings. She got important people to come to the screenings from the UN, from different political entities. She really worked her screening. She, she, she knew what she was doing, and she was able to generate a lot of attention, but also she got a lot of very important people. She got congressmen. She, she did get some of the major players in the UN to watch her film. And I believe, it would be hard to say concretely, but I do believe that she played a role in the UN resolution that was passed on rape. So it's, it's, that to me is a very concrete example of a filmmaker making a difference and using their film as a tool for change, which is really what, what these films are about. So in a sense, part of the festival is an advocacy opportunity around each of these different things that you're bringing up. Where, where do you see those advocacy opportunities in this festival? In this edition? Well, that's a good question. I mean, every year when we, when we, you're right, it's an advocacy tool, the festival, because the filmmakers who come in, and this year I think we have, you know, 90% of the filmmakers here, uh, a number of them are from New York as well, but they have the opportunity to meet with Human Rights Watch staff, and also Human Rights Watch staff or the festival often set up meetings with people that they wanted to meet that are here in New York or maybe in D.C., and a number of these films also go to Silver Ducks, so there's a nice, we have a nice um, a confluence with Silver Ducks with a lot of films that we show over the years. So it's, it's really that opportunity to, to meet these people that makes, that adds that extra layer of why the films and having the filmmaker in, in a physical space is, is important. So some of the advocacy opportunities that I see um, for this festival our opening night is a good example, the reckoning, um, the battle for the International Criminal Court. I mean, the, the ICC, and there's a, one of the reasons we made it the opening night is because we wanted to highlight the ICC here in our 20th anniversary. It, it seems like a very perfect opportunity to say to the U.S. and to the world that, you know, this is an important body, and it, it, it's, it's an important structure. It needs to be supported. And as we know, the U.S. doesn't support the ICC yet. Uh, so I think that the filmmakers are using this high-profile opening. I mean, it's our biggest slot of the festival to um, bring the film around to people who can actually make decisions or who can help make decisions 
and reach people in the Obama administration and put some pressure on them to look at this issue. And even though they have a lot of other things on their plate, as we all know, this is a very important issue for the, for the world, um, for the U.S., but for the world, is to make the ICC more than just sort of a backwater court, which is what it will become if it is not supported fully by everybody in the next few years. So I think that's one where I see one opportunity, because the, the filmmaker Pamela Yates is a, is a consummate uh, speaker, and she's a, she's a very, very strong outreach advocate. She knows how to work issues, and she knows how to get her film seen by the right people. And I think we're just a vehicle, and I'm happy to be a vehicle, to bring the film and the is that issue to politicians and to, to people who really can make, make policy. So that's one of the big ones. I also think there's some other issues that are very resonant that, you know, I hope that some, something comes of them, but then it becomes a question of, you know, how strong the filmmakers are at taking their film and using it for a tool. That's always an unknown. And with a lot of these films, you sometimes feel like the filmmakers are burned out a little bit. You know, they've been on the festival circuit, they've been pushing the film for a while, and it's, it, it's, it sometimes makes me feel a little sad to see them, you know, a little bit tired in the process when you're hoping they will, you know, be able to outreach the film in, in, in a much wider sense. So maybe that's sort of the downside of being alone as a filmmaker making films on human rights issues. But on the upside, you do have people who are really really finding their way of how to use the film and to use media like The Hub and to use all these different tools that is modern technology, which I think ultimately will benefit these kinds of films and allow these people to not have to use a, a, you know, a traditional distributor, which, which a lot of them are not going to really take your film and do what they should with the film. They're going to bury it in a catalog somewhere. And for me, the future of these kinds of films is taking them by yourself and self-distributing them and being creative in how you reach an audience outside of just a theatrical or even a festival or through you know, educational distribution, which really won't get them as far as they need to go with these films. If you look at that future that you're talking about where people are self-distributing, people are occupying very, very different venues, if you like, um, using very, very different channels and sort of opportunities and occupying a very different landscape in a way than they did through what was a pretty strict, industrialised way of distributing right. um, visual images. What do you see as the future role of the festival? How will it evolve? What will it become as that landscape changes? Well, see, that that's a very good question. I mean, in a sense, it's a very big unknown. Like, the future of film festivals in the landscape in 10 years, let's say, well, even five years. I, I, I mean, I, I'm sort of coming back to what we said before a little bit, but I, I do feel like there is something very powerful in the human connection, and that will always remain. So, we're, well, you'll be able to see these films in many different settings, um, downloading and, you know, who knows how, how they're going to be used. I, I see a lot of filmmakers turning their films into modules, different length films tailored for specific audiences from a one-minute clip all the way up to the full feature. And that's something that's very important, you know, this sort of boutique film, making your film tailored to the audience so that they will actually take it in. But I do think that there's always going to be a physical festival that's going to make people want to come and see these films with the filmmaker present there physically. And so I, I, I mean, I'm a, I struggle with this and I think about it quite a bit of what, what the future, what lies in the future for film festivals. Um, I don't think that they're going to go the way of like the LP. You know, I think you will always have festivals. I think maybe. I think there will be a shakeup at some point and a lot of festivals will sort of fall by the wayside because right now there are thousands of film festivals worldwide and I don't know that 
the, that they can all be supported um, with the films that, with the good films that are out there. I mean, you see a lot of films that that ha have to turn down 10, 20 festivals because there's so much demand for them and they have to concentrate on certain festivals. And I think with that concentration, eventually you'll see the winnowing of some of these festivals or people will realize that it's expensive to put on a festival and maybe the actual people who are going to found a film festival will come up with a different sort of structure of showing these films, whether, for instance, you see a lot of these online ventures happening right now where they're, they want to stream high-end films. They want to show them in very high-end um, format and they want to be very selective. I've been, uh, I've been contacted by a number of people starting these kinds of ventures and trying to build a library of films. And that's actually kind of interesting, although I find m most of these people are um, very much at the beginning of the idea, and so it's a little hard to get behind it because you can see that they have a lot of, you know, Film Festival 101, Film Festival 201, Film Festival 301. They have a lot of learning. They have a big learning curve ahead of them. And so it kind of makes you wonder, well, do, you, do I want to partner with this person yet or do I want to wait until the next generation comes along? Because they're, they, they're, it's a very complicated, I think it's a very complicated endeavor to show these films in very high end without any blips and also to find your audience in a world that's very, uh, you know, internet fractured. I mean, people are, their attention spans are all over the place. You have to find a way of narrowing the focus of that kind of an entity and finding a real kernel that's going to make people say, wow, that is, now I want to, I want to look at what their latest film is that they've just gotten up. Because that's, that's, a, that's where the, the, the crux of it is. How do you actually deliver the audience? You know, they, they, they come in, they talk a lot about these, you know, this great high-end streaming and stuff. But my question always to them is, and wh where is your audience coming from? How are you getting your audience? And that's where they don't really have an answer yet. So I think we're a generation, not a generation, but we're, you know, we're 10 years away from seeing some very slick uh, presentations of sort of online film festivals. And, you know, we maybe we will end up being a part of that, but I'm still waiting to see the technology work. The Youth Producing Change Program is, it's our second year that we're featuring it, and it's, a, it's an important program for the festival because we get to hear from people 19 years and under, which is not that common in the world of human rights. So we are very proud to present this program and to have these filmmakers featured. And the other thing that is very, I think, very special about it is we bring most of the filmmakers here and they have a Q&A and there's a, there's a big line of youth up on stage and they get asked all these questions. And I think the audience really, really appreciates it. Last year they all had a standing ovation. It was a very nice event. But also because it allows us as programmers to listen to these youth, not just through their films, but also what they say. Uh, on the stage or when talking to us afterwards and it informs us and it gives us a better understanding of some of the concerns of younger people uh, when it comes to human rights and it that therefore informs the way we program in the future because everything informs the way you program whether it's the newspaper you read or the person you just talked to about something so having youth in the festival makes the festival stronger and it also makes it more youthful, which is a very nice thing to have when it's sometimes hard to connect with younger people on human rights issues. This allows us a gateway into that kind of a connection. This year we, we decided to have a special series of former Nestor Almendros Award winning films we have given the Nestor Almendros Award to, let's see, oh my gosh, it's been, I think, 13 films over the years. And we picked, f we picked five of them this year. And I think we picked them because they're representative of interesting issues, not only because they're 
fabulous films and all of them are, are jewels, but because also their a number of them speak to the present, even though they were made a number of years ago. I mean, you have a film like um, Regret to Inform, which was Barbara Sonnenbart's film, which opened the festival 10 years ago. And um, she's coming to this also, which is kind of moving. Uh, and it's about, Viet it's about Vietnam, and it's about you know women from different sides, the Vietnamese women and American women, talking to each other and forming a dialogue. And to me, it speaks to all the veterans we have coming back from Iraq and from Afghanistan and how they're going to reintegrate into society when a lot of them have been so damaged. And I think that's a huge underlying issue in this country that hasn't been addressed or hasn't been addressed by the government, certainly. Um, you have hundreds of thousands of veterans and a lot, most of them have post-traumatic stress disorder even if they don't know it. So that was, that was an interesting thing. And, and I think the others too, for the most part, we used them to echo and to just sort of make people think about some of these issues. We have Iraq in Fragments, which is James Longley's beautiful film in three parts on Iraq. And Iraq may be winding down for the US, but there's a lot of issues there that are yet to be addressed. And it's, it's something that Sadly, you know, the media moves on to other things, but the country itself is very uh, divided still, and it's, I mean, it's up in the air as to what's going to happen there still. And I think the American public has sort of lost sight of that because Afghanistan has, of course, become the main focus at this point. So that was sort of echoing back to that. And then we also have a film on Afghanistan, which is Jung in the Land of the Mujahideen, which is by one of my favorite filmmakers, Fabrizio Lazaretti, and he's gonna be here at that screening. And again, you know, obviously Afghanistan and the Obama administration has decided to focus strongly on Afghanistan again because it's really been spinning out of control. So it's important to bring those back and it shows you sort of the strength of human rights films and filmmaking when you're able to bring a group of films like this back that won our, our main award in the festival and see how relevant they and how timely they still are in many ways. The events that they're portraying may have passed, but the, the overall, the overarching issue is still there in that country, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, or here in the US with our soldiers. So I, I think that was sort of the impetus of which films to pick this year for the Nestor uh, retrospective. And then what's nice about it is it all leads up to our current Nestor winner, which is uh, Anne Aguillon and her absolutely marvelous film, My Neighbor, My Killer, which to me is, I find it very moving because it's a nine year project that she's worked on. It's the third film in a trilogy. We've shown the other two films. They're all on Rwanda and the aftermath of the genocide. And this film to me is really the film she was, she has been searching for and the film she's wanted to make over the last nine years. And it is a, it's a just a, it's just a beautifully layered emotional film that really, really takes you into an understanding of what it must feel like to try and reconcile with, with killers, with people who have murdered your friends or your family and to do that to allow your country to move forward, uh, a country that's completely divided, Rwanda, where people have been released from prisons and the Gachacha trials have been not terribly successful. Uh, a lot of people feel justice hasn't been done. And how does that country move forward? And that is a, a really important human rights question. And it's one that you see repeated over and over in other places in Iraq, in Afghanistan, it will come to pass anywhere that there's been a conflict and a major conflict, somehow the country's gonna have to move forward. So I think it was really appropriate to have this film as this year's Nestor Almendrosa winner and to anchor the former Nestor winners um, in, in a one week sort of setting like this.